This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. The events of the end times for the typical believer are misunderstood at best. They know Yeshua returns, they know he rules and reigns for a thousand years, but everything else before and after is a bit of a blur. Tonight, Michael Rood will make it all clear and help us understand what our role is in the end times. It's the final episode of Blindness of the Gentiles because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to episode eight of Blindness of the Gentiles. This is the final episode. You do not want to miss this one tonight. And my co-host today is Svi. Svi, welcome to Shabbat Thank Night Live. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, Shabbat Shalom to everyone. Shabbat Shalom. And now, I didn't want to butcher your last name. So if you could say to us your last name. Well, I go for the sake of making it easier by Svi Ben Daniel. Svi Ben Daniel. Okay, we'll make it that easy. And you are part of our Spanish team. You are a, a vital part of our Spanish team. And folks may know you from uh, blog posts and our uh, radio in Spanish. And so uh, we wanted to bring you on today just to uh, explain all of the exciting things going on in Spanish. And the first thing I wanted to note was something that we've uh, we've made uh, available for the last couple of weeks, and that is the Chronological Gospels Kindle version in Spanish. Can you tell us how this came about? Yes, this is a very, very exciting moment uh, in our timeline. It's a real milestone for us. We have been working on this for years. What many people do not know is that while we were translating the chronological Gospels um, into Spanish, we were at the same time working very closely with people that uh, were translating it for, uh, into Chinese Shout out to our very dear uh, Showa from Taiwan and uh, Pamela, another lady, was translating it into uh, French. So at the same time, we were doing that and we were uh, as well helping the second edition of the English. We were adding a, a ton of notes. Um, I have uh, experience uh, with the Hebrew language, so where I saw fit, we discussed even with Michael, um, we were on periodic meetings with Michael discussing a, a feedback from the other translators. So this is something that will help to even further the English version. Uh, and we are super excited that finally came to fruition uh, two weeks ago into the Spanish and people are crazy about it and they are all over it. And, you know, we looked at the uh, the stats already in just a couple of weeks, more than 200 downloads of this thing already. So it's just going to keep going up from here. So Yes, it is amazing. And, uh, you know, going into the Latin American Spanish speaking world, uh, you know, not being in the United States is uh, even more difficult to make a purchase uh, of this kind, uh, to support the ministry. So we really, really appreciate uh, the support uh, of our audience and all the people that have downloaded. We did not expect uh, this turnout uh, this soon. So we are super pumped. Now, you mentioned uh, support, Sfi, I want to get into that for a second, that, you know, when people, uh, English-speaking people, see Shabbat Night Live and they donate and all, the only language they speak is maybe English, they need to know that their donations also support the international part of A Root Awakening International, and their support feeds into all of these other languages as well, including into what you do. That's exactly right. And just so that people know uh, how far this goes, uh, just some numbers so that people will know at a glance, uh, our YouTube channel reached 174,000 subscribers. Like we just imagine, we, we just passed the English one. We have a little bit of a healthy competition. Uh, we passed the English and we went like a, a 
10,000 subscribers a month. Now it went a little bit down, but we are going to get to 200,000 subscribers. Our uh, website um, had almost 60,000 visits last month, Scott. Uh, the last two months, it doubled what it had in April. Uh, and in March. So it's a really good return. We get the uh, emails. We have a small team, but we keep very busy. Each of us uh, do a bunch of stuff. We have a um, radio show. Many people do not know if you guys uh, speak Spanish there or you know anyone that speaks Spanish. Uh, every other week, we uh, post a new radio show. We go live on YouTube. Uh, and every other week, we have a translated teaching from Michael Rood, as well as all our uh, blog material. We translate even the biblical calendar, and we try to keep up with what you guys do in English so that uh, we can reach at the same level the Spanish-speaking world. Well, we uh, certainly appreciate what you guys do too, because uh, a lot of your blogs that you do, you, this, this team that you have there um, has a lot of insight into things that maybe we don't necessarily think about on the English side of things. So we're actually uh, tag teaming there where we want to take some of the blogs that you've done and convert them into English because there's some very interesting points being made there too. Now, your, your team, uh, it's not just in the U.S. Now, you're in the U.S., but uh, there's folks uh, all over the place, isn't there? Well, we are... Uh Two of us, uh, me and uh, I'm thinking of Miguel, uh, lives in Texas, but he also writes blogs and is with us at the radio show. Then we have Harold that lives in Costa Rica, uh, and uh, he's also part of our radio show. Harold, sometimes we joke about it. We say he was in the ministry before Michael Rood. <laughs> Harold <laughs> has been there before all of us. Uh, shout out to Harold. And uh, then we have a large number of volunteers that we are very proud to call our brothers and sisters and also big shout out to them, a couple of them from Colombia, um, Marta and Lali. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, in Costa Rica also uh, uh, Steven and Esteban in Argentina. They work every month. We come out with a new uh, Bible study that people can print out in PDF and study from home in, or in their Shabbat congregation. So all this uh, helped us really reach a lot of people and um, we are going to continue forward. All right. Well, Sophia, I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you for giving us an insight on not only what the Spanish team is doing, but also in uh, French and Chinese and, and even Russian. We have some folks working on Russian things. Uh, Elena Sauber from Texas is also helping us with uh, some Russian things. So again, thank you for uh, joining us today. And uh, we really appreciate all you do for A Rude Awakening International. Thank you. Thank you. Anytime, Scott. Shalom, everyone. Shalom. All right. Well, tonight, Michael Rood strips off the blinders for a final episode and lays out the details of the end times, including the feasts of the Lord that every Gentile will come to know sooner or later. And get ready for the Kiddush with Michael. That's coming up next. When Yeshua encountered the Samaritan woman at the well, his disciples were shocked. But why? Who were the Samaritans? And what lessons can the mistakes of the Samaritans teach us today about the right way to follow the Almighty? Michael Rood presents The Samaritans, the little known background story of a Gentile people whose lifestyle serves as a warning for the Christian world today. You're gonna find out as we dig deeper exactly where these people are coming from and how they have added to the Torah 267 significant changes so that they have a state religion. The Samaritans is an exclusive teaching you won't see anywhere online. The only way to get it is to receive it as our gift to say thank you for supporting A Rude Awakening International. Donate a $50 love gift to the ministry and we'll send you this exclusive teaching on DVD or Blu-ray. Or for a donation of $100, we'll send you the Samaritans plus an insulated Shabbat picnic bag bearing the Hebrew name of Yehovah. Or as a special offer for a donation of $300, we'll send you the Samaritans, the insulated Shabbat picnic bag, and a dazzling set of silver-plated bookends featuring a depiction of ancient Jerusalem and the name of the city in both English and Hebrew on the city wall. These gifts are available only in July and only while supplies last. 
Get The Samaritan's Teaching for a love gift donation of $50. The Teaching and the Insulated Shabbat Picnic Bag for a donation of $100. Or get The Teaching, the Picnic Bag, and the Silver-Plated Bookends Depicting Ancient Jerusalem for a donation of $300. Hurry, offer ends July 31st while supplies last. Call 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or visit monthlylovegift.com. When Yeshua fed the 5,000 with leaven barley loaves in the Galilee, the Pharisees came down on him because they accused him that he and his disciples did not wash their hands before they ate bread. They did not wash their hands with a negle vesser and say this prayer, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us by your commandments, commanding us concerning the washing of hands. Why didn't Yeshua do that? Why didn't his disciples follow that? Because it is takanot. It is a law which they invented, and Moses said no one is ever allowed to add to or subtract from. But the night of the Last Supper, Yeshua took bread, and he put in place a rehearsal that was really put in place by the Kohen Gadol, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek himself brought forth bread and wine to Abraham. And Yeshua interpreted that very thing. Barukata Yelva Elahinu Melech Ha'olam Hamotzi Lechem Miharetz. This is what Yeshua put in place, that before we eat bread, that we say this prayer. And as often as we do this, we do it in remembrance of him because his broken body was broken for us, and by his stripes we were healed. So as often as we do this, as often we do it in remembrance of him. And Yeshua took the cup, and he said, Baruch atah Yehovah Elohino Melech HaLam, Barei Pri Hagafen. The creator of the fruit of the vine, Yehovah, created the fruit of the vine, he said, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do this, remember me, and remember, I will be drinking this with you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Shabbat Shalom. We have made it to the day of Shavuot, the feast of Shavuot, the feast of sevens, which happens on the day after the seventh Sabbath of the counting of the Omer. The counting of the Omer begins with the first fruits presentation in the temple, and that is when Yeshua presented the first fruits from among the dead and seated them in the heavenly 
temple. These are the 24 elders seated on thrones of gold with golden crowns that are seated around the sea of fire and glass that we read about in the book of Revelation. Yeshua then, after presenting the first fruits in the Father's throne, comes back down to the earth, and then it begins the counting of the seven Sabbaths. On the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost, uh, the 50th day had fully come, that's when the 12, and could have been more, but we know that the 12, which includes Peter and Mattia, they were all in the temple on the high day of Shavuot uh, for the festivities with hundreds of thousands of people who have come from all around the world, and they then, when they hear this mighty rushing wind, this sound, and they recognize this as Yeshua's instructions, when you hear this heavy breathing, this <sighs> and you see this pillar of fire, then they know. They were all filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And as this was noised abroad, as the thousands and thousands of people came together and heard them, they are listening to them and they are all speaking in other tongues, but they're speaking the wonderful works of God and they're speaking them in the perfect dialect, perfect diction of the nations where all these Jews and proselytes had come from all around the world, converging on Jerusalem for this feast by the hundreds of thousands and when they hear this, they are amazed, they're startled, what does this mean? Some mock said they're full of glucose wine, full of brandy, Carvassier, Bailey's Irish cream, what have you, fortified wine, which is part of the celebration of the feast. But no, Peter says it's only nine o'clock in the morning and it is forbidden. You don't come up onto the Temple Mount having drunk. The priests are not allowed to drink on the Temple Mount. The, this is a holy convocation. And at night, if it's nine o'clock at night, may be a point that you may have, but it's nine o'clock in the morning. These are not drunk as you suppose. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Yoel. And the prophet Yoel uh, said, It shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Elvah, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids will I pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I shall show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor, pillars of smoke, literally, uh, from the Hebrew. Pillars of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before that great and notable day of Yehovah comes. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of Yehovah shall be saved. Now he is not saying that this is a fulfillment of that prophecy, but this is that which is spoken by Joel, is that the spirit of the living God is in now being manifest. These people are filled with the spirit of God. And they are, just as it says, and will be fulfilled, your young men will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams. Upon them I will pour out of my spirit, of my spirit. This is what he's saying. This is the spirit of God that is being poured out. He's not saying this is a fulfillment of this prophecy. And it's important that we understand what that prophecy is about. Because in the last days, this is the time that we read about, and I've spoken much about, Zechariah's thermal nuclear war. We've spoken about this, that in Yoel, in the second chapter, it talks about this, that there is an invasion of Israel, a full-scale invasion of Israel in which nobody can stop this army coming in. Nothing can stop them. Before them, it's like the Garden of Eden greenhouses throughout the land of Israel, down below my house, I mean right out my front door in front of my house for 14 years are all the, the mango groves and then the date palms and all going down to the Sea of Galilee and then across, I look across and see the, the vast fields of bananas 
and then all down the, the, the valley, the, the whole land of Israel is fed by this invention, this irrigation invention of Israel that, that feeds all these individual trees and they have exported this technology to the whole world. The United States is filled with Israel's irrigation technology because it's like the Garden of Eden before this army, and behind them, it's a smoldering, desolate wasteland. No one can stop them. It's all over but the crying. And then Israel's leaders and the priest call for a fast. They call for a fast, and everyone in the nation begins to fast because it's over with. Israel is now going to be completely destroyed. They call for a fast. They call upon Yehovah, as it says. He doesn't call upon the name of the Lord. The Lord is not his name. Call upon Yehovah. And Yehovah hears from heaven, and he is the one who incinerates this army. The stench of this army with their with their bodies that have been vaporized, that they 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 the smoke goes up into heaven and fills the nostril of the holy God as this entire army is destroyed. As Zechariah reports this, that their eyes are consumed away in their sockets and their tongue is consumed away out of their mouth before their body hits the deck. And then when God fights for Israel. When Yehovah fights for Israel, he says, all those who call upon the name of Yehovah shall be saved. If you want to call upon the name of the Lord, call upon Baal, call upon, oh, sweet baby Jesus, or whatever your imagination is, you're on your own, sweetheart. Those who call upon the name of Yehovah. This is why he says Israel comes back into the land. The Gentiles come to Israel. They repent for the abominations and the false gods and the false religions that they've inherited from Rome and everything else and all this uh, this repeat after me prayer nonsense and disobeying Yeshua, not listening to what he says, not doing what he says to do, and we've concocted our own religion. All who want to do that, they're on their own. But those who repent, it says, the, the Almighty God will make known his hand and his might and his strength. And the Gentiles, even the Gentiles, will know that my name is Yehovah. So all those who call upon the name of Yehovah shall be saved. The rest of them, sorry. You're on your own. You don't want to repent. You, you don't want to admit that you've, you, you've in, inherited a freak religion, constructed a pagan sun god worship and other things, little baby Jesus mixed in here, a few, uh, you know, a verse here, a verse there, you know, your, your systematic theologies, you know, where you're on your own. But... Those who call upon the name of Yehovah shall be saved. And then it says uh, that he will pour out his spirit. The early rain and the latter rain. A double portion of the spirit will be poured out upon all flesh. And these people who are filled with the spirit of God then go out and takes the gospel out to the rest of the world. This is when the blindness in part that has happened to Israel is removed. And this is when they look on him of whom they appear, not as he comes in the clouds, but in the testimony that God put in the earth of his son. The spirit and the water and the blood that came out of Yeshua's side, down through that earthquake crack, upon the Ark of the Covenant. These three bear record, bear witness in the earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and this is the testimony that God gave of his son. When this is recognized and the ark of the covenant comes forth, as Jeremiah said, and the cloud of glory is again seen above the mercy seat as it was in the days of Solomon and Moses, and as the tabernacle of David, as Amos prophesied, will be rebuilt 
When this comes to pass, and the double portion of the Holy Spirit is poured out, after this war that darkens the sun, the moon, and stars, after this war in which these 35 feet cylindrical containers, six and a half feet in diameter, with an evil fire offering, come against the land of Israel from the land of Shinar, from Iran, Iraq, come against the land of Israel and obliterate entire buildings and leave behind a deadly residue, incinerate the wood and the stone. And yet the Almighty, when it looks like there's no hope for Israel's survival, the Almighty fights for Israel. See, this is a prophecy that has not yet come to pass. All that is written will come to pass. And this is why we are told to study to show ourselves approved as workmen who need not to be ashamed Workmen who rightly divide the word of truth. This is the word of truth, but it has to be rightly divided. We have to understand where these things take place, and thankfully, Yeshua, in the book of the Revelation, shows us where all of these things fit, in what order they are going to fit in, because they will all be fulfilled. Yeshua will fulfill all these things that were written of him in the Torah, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, and he will reign as the king, but not yet. Because here is a double portion of the Holy Spirit. This is the early rain and the latter rain. The early rain is what we're reading about in Acts chapter two. The Holy Spirit poured out upon these people. It's not the time of this war, obviously, but it is the Holy Spirit being poured out. This is the early rain. And I know there's all sorts of stuff in, in this paganized churchianity talking about the latter rain back in the 1950s that turned out so many of these false prophets. And, and yet, what started out is a brief resprinkling of the early rain, but they said it's the latter rain. No, it's not the latter rain. The latter rain doesn't come until after this war. That is nonsense. The latter rain didn't happen yet. But yet, they've selected a verse here, a verse there, a soundbite here, a soundbite there, here a little, there a little, constructed this whole thing. And now these same people are the ones that, that you know, are, are, are saying God is doing a new thing by taking all these people to heaven and taking these people to hell and, and they come back with these tall tales and yet it's none of this. This is reality. What we're seeing through the charismaniacs and throw those who deny the power of God, they have a form of godliness, like my Baptist church, a form of godliness, but deny the power, deny that these things, they're called cessationists, that, that these things have all ceased, that the apostolic gifts ceased. Well, calling them apostolic gifts just shows me what kind of idiot you are. They are not apostolic gifts. And the power of God has not ceased. And even they will admit that, that God does heal, that there are miracles that happen, but they call him apostolic gifts that have ceased. It's just because they have selected number sound bites and they've made up categories and they have pronounced their, their nonsense, and that is why the power of God is not alive. Because of the artist, the con artist, that is across the board in Gentile churchianity that have tortured the scriptures. Now. Let's go back to the text because what Peter is saying here is so incredible. It shall come to pass, verse 21, 21, all those who call upon the name of Yehovah shall be saved. That's what it says in Yoel. That's why we know definitively that it's not call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, Kurios, that's just Lord, that's just master. Yeshua is called Lord by even just rank unbelievers, you know? He's just acknowledging that, yeah, he's the, he's the master. You know, it, it's like calling, uh, in Phariseeism, calling someone rabbi. Rabbi means great one. It doesn't mean teacher, it means great one. Rav is great one. And so it's like calling him master. Rav, Rav, rabbi. 
No, but here in Greek, if it's just Lord, just calling him Lord or Master, that's one thing. But no, this is all those who call upon the name of Yehovah shall be saved. So you better recognize his name and call upon his name because he hears from heaven. It's just like the ironic blessing. When the priest, the, the, the priest of Aaron put his name on the people by this blessing, Yivarechicha Yehovah, when they put his name, he hears from heaven and he, will heal his people. He will give his people what his people need by you speaking this blessing and putting it on the people. That's why just saying, Yivarekecha Adonai does nothing. He doesn't hear it, he pays no attention because it's nonsense. He's not Adonai, he is Yehovah. He is not just Lord, he is Yehovah. And then Peter goes on. Ye men of Israel, again, put yourself in here. Hundreds of thousands of people all listening. They have the attention of the world. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Yeshua of Nazareth, a man approved by God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of all of you. As you yourselves already know, him, Yeshua, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God set this up. Before the overthrow of the world, before the relinquishing of this world by Adam. The authority that Adam was given as the God of this age, the God of this world, with all the dominion and the power and authority on this earth before he relinquished it to Satan. Before he delivered it into Satan's hands, God had determined that he had a plan. He had a plan to redeem the earth from the power of Satan. He had a plan, and Yeshua was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. He laid his life down. You didn't take it, but him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken, and by wicked hands, you have crucified him, and you have slain him whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, having loosed the restraints of death, because it is not possible that he could be held by it. When a person dies, that's it. They have died, and death holds them in that grip. It's a figure of speech. In the grip of death, and they are held by that grip until the resurrection. They are dead and in the grave like Yeshua was, but it was not possible that he could be held in the grip of death because God has raised him from the dead. Once a person dies, they are in the grip of death. They are in the grave. Hell, as in, uh, in King James here, but it was not possible, I continue on, it is not possible that death could hold him. For David, David spoke concerning him. I foresaw, I saw beforehand, by revelation, I saw beforehand the Lord, always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I shall not be moved. I foresaw the Lord, Yehovah, always before my face, for he, Yeshua, is on my right hand that I shall not be moved. We're gonna see how he, he fleshes this out. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh my body, my flesh shall rest in hope. I will go to the grave in hope. I will go into the earth with hope. 
because thou will not leave my soul in hell. Thou will not leave my soul in hell. Just as David's son, the Messiah, it was not possible that the grave should be able to hold him. David knows that he is gonna rest in hope because his son would be given the power over death. He would be given the power to raise and to judge. And it's not possible that that is because thou will not leave my soul in hell. And the word again, hell is the grave. Sheol, the grave. This is not the lake of fire. The grave is not the lake of fire. Hell is not the lake of fire. The lake of fire was created for the devil and his angels, Satan and his angels. In Yeshua, at the end of the millennial reign, he is going to raise everyone from the dead who has ever lived. Those who have not yet been raised, because at the last trump, he is he is going to raise, and, and this is what, what Paul says. Everyone will be made alive after their own order. Messiah. Comma, I'm punctuating correctly. The first fruits, comma, those who Yeshua raised after he was raised and presented them in the throne room. They are the first fruits. Those who are Messiahs at his parousia, at his coming, those who belong to Messiah, those are the ones who belong to him, whether they are in the grave and their body is rotted, they will be raised with an incorruptible body, First, and then we which are in Messiah, who are alive and remain, the mortal would put on immortality and be caught up together with the dead who have been raised with a now incorruptible body, and we will be caught up together, caught up, harpazo, rapturo together with them, and then we will meet the Lord Yeshua in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But just a minute. No, we're not gonna be with the Lord forever in the air. That's nonsense. That's that. That's just taking one word, one phrase, isolating it, and making a whole stupid eschatology out of it because Yeshua is going to gather us at the last trump to the sea of fire and glass. Well, we're in the sea of fire and glass, the judgment seat of the Messiah, being judged for reward or loss, being judged according to what we've done, because if we've done what he has asked us to do, we're going to be able to come back with him and rule as priests and kings upon the earth. But at this point, where we're on the sea of fire and glass, the bowls of wrath are poured out upon the earth. No one goes into the marriage supper of the Lamb. No one enters the tabernacle in heaven until the bowls of wrath are poured out. When the last bowl of wrath is poured out, out of the throne room comes a cry, it is finished, and then the bride who's dressed herself in garments of righteousness, righteousnesses, the righteous acts of the saints, then the bride is called by name, individual names, into the marriage supper of the Lamb, where the bride is, dines with Yeshua in the marriage supper of the Lamb, in the Mishkan in heaven during the Feast of Tabernacles and on Hershon Rabbah, the last great day, Yeshua comes back to the earth. Uh, Michael grabs Satan, binds him with a chain, cast him into bottles of pit for a thousand years, and this is when we live and reign with Messiah a thousand years. At the end of that period of time, everyone who has not gotten up yet will get up. They will then be judged. Those whose names are not written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. The dead are in the grave. David says he will rest in hope because thou will not leave my soul in the grave. Neither will you allow, suffer your holy one, my son, the Messiah, to see corruption. Yeshua is in the grave three days and three nights, but he came out and his body was not corrupted because he was raised from the dead. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, David said. The ways of life is this. You live, you die, your body rots, 
then there's a resurrection. Yeshua is the one that's gonna raise the dead. And when he raises the dead and they're caught up and the living are changed and caught up, and then we meet him in the air to the sea of fire and glass, the marriage supper of the Lamb for those who qualify, then all back down on the earth to live and reign with Messiah for a thousand years. And if we have done what he's asked us to do, then we get authority over 10 cities, over five cities, over one city. Or we just sat on our dead butt and done nothing. <sighs> A thousand years, then death and hell are cast in the lake of fire. The grave and death are destroyed. The earth is incinerated, burned away with a fervent heat. Yes, global warming is finally coming to town with Yeshua. And after it all disappears, then there's a new heaven and a new earth and new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, down upon the earth. And Yeshua cries out, the curse has ended. We now get to eat of the tree of life in the midst of the garden. He has made known, and David says, he has made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance, with thy presence, with Yeshua's countenance, with him in his resurrected body. He will make me full of joy, and I'm going to rest in hope. I know that I'm going to get up. I know my son, the Messiah, will raise the dead, and he will reward the righteous. And then he said, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you about the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and the sepulcher is with us unto this day. He says, David is dead, He's buried, his, his sepulchre's with us, his body is rotted, he is resting in hope because he knows the Messiah is going to raise him. But it says, his sepulchre's with us today, therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn, Yehovah has sworn to him, all we have to do is go back to David's writings and see that Yehovah had sworn to, with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, that he would raise up Messiah to sit on his throne at the right hand of the throne of the Almighty, which he's already alluded to. He, he, David, the prophet, seeing this before, seeing it beforehand, seeing it by revelation as a prophet, seeing that Messiah was gonna be raised up to sit on his throne, on David's throne, and in the meantime, sitting on the throne at the right hand of the Father, sitting on his throne, spoke of the resurrection of Messiah. That his soul, his soul was not left in the grave. Neither did his flesh see corruption. This Yeshua, David's offspring, right from the lineage of David, from David through his only earthly parent, parent Miriam, the daughter of Yaakov, Yosef ben Yaakov, as we read in the Hebrew Matthew, This Yeshua, God has raised up, whereof we, we, all of us right here, we 12, we are all witnesses, Matia among them. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, he has been exalted to the right hand of the Father in heaven. He's seated at the right hand. He's exalted to that position and having received the promise of the Father, the promise received of the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Yeshua, has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. These men, speaking in other tongues the wonderful works of God, they have been filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. 
They have received into manifestation, they are lambanoing, manifesting this gift of the Holy Spirit which Yeshua has now shed forth. This is what you are seeing and hearing. For David has not ascended into the heavens. Oh, even David didn't get to go to heaven. But this is, this is Hallmark Christianity. When you die, you get to go to heaven immediately. Check in at the gate, you get a harp, you get a cigar, you get to sit on a cloud, you get some wings, and all this nonsense. Well, David, Yeshua's great, 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 great grandfather has not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself. Yehovah, oh, in here, in King James, it actually has capital L-O-R-D. Hear the translators one time do it right because they know it doesn't make sense otherwise. So they had to quote it right straight from the Torah. Yehovah said unto my Lord. Yehovah said unto Adonai, sit thou on my right hand until I make your foes, your footstool. So David saw this, that his offspring would be seated on the right hand of the Father, that his offspring was raised from the dead, that he would be a high priest forever after the order of the Melchizedek, that his offspring would sit on his throne and he will judge. He will raise the dead, he will judge the living and the dead. He saw this all beforehand. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Yeshua, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Messiah. This is the first time anyone has ever been allowed to say that Yeshua is the Messiah. Yeshua told one Gentile woman sitting at a well when she said, I know when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. Yeshua said, you're looking at him, sweetie. But never allowed anyone to say it. When he asked his disciples, Peter chirped up and said, I know you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Yeshua said, you're blessed, Peter. Flesh and blood didn't show it to you. I didn't show it to you. My Father in heaven showed it to you. But then he turned to all of his disciples and said, but don't you tell anyone. Tell no one, because I must be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles by the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And the Gentiles will crucify and kill me. And I'll be dead and in the grave three days and three nights and raised on the third day. Don't tell anyone, I must do this. Now Peter, on the day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the gift, manifesting, filled to overflowing, said this same Yeshua, that David, a prophet who saw beforehand all this, he saw the resurrection, he saw these things, and now you understand, this is the very scripture that Yeshua challenged the Pharisees and the religious leaders with just the day before his crucifixion. How is it that David said, Yehovah said and calls Yehovah said unto Adonai at thy right hand. He calls him Adonai and later in the same psalm calls him Adonai. How is it? He calls him Adonai at the right hand of Yehovah. How is it that David is his son? He's calling him Adonai, and then he calls him Adonai, and now Peter is going to lay it out. This same Yeshua, who challenged you on this, and after Yeshua asked him that question, how does David call him Adonai, Right after he calls him Adonai at the right hand side of Yehovah, how is he then his son? 
and it says they didn't ask him another question. They couldn't handle it. Peter is going to handle it for him right now. This same Yeshua, whom you have crucified, Yehovah has made both Lord and Messiah. Lord and Messiah. He is the first one to be able to announce and pronounce that he is the Messiah. This is the one Yeshua said, don't tell anyone, but now he's allowed to tell because Yeshua has accomplished what he was to accomplish. Now he has shed forth this, the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. He has now completed the 70-week ministry from when Yeshua was baptized in water until he baptizes with the Holy Spirit is exactly 70 weeks, 490 days. He has now fulfilled that which started at the Feast of Shavuot a year before, and then he announced in the synagogue at Nazareth to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, Yehovah, and he closed the scroll, and so from that Shavuot until this Shavuot, now it is fulfilled. Yeshua's ministry is fulfilled. Now, this is why in the Chronological Gospels, I have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts as the as the Gospels and the Revelation. But now it says, this same Yeshua, whom you crucified and slain, Yehovah has made, made both Lord, no, not Lord, both Yehovah, say the oath, and Messiah. This is the fulfillment. Yehovah, say the oath. All power has now been given unto me, as Yeshua said. All power in heaven and earth. All authority to raise the dead and to judge the dead and to raise the dead and to judge the angels. The Father has put all judgment into his hands and he is going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem during the millennial reign and the nations of the world will come up. All who have escaped and did not come to fight against him at the battle of Armageddon, all these nations will come up and worship the king, Yehovah Sevaot. And that's why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, no one can say that Yeshua is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. No, no one can say Yeshua is Yehovah. Yehovah, say the oath. He has been given the authority by Yehovah the Father. And he comes in the Father's name and he has been given that authority. Yehovah it says, has made him both Yehovah, Sevaot, and Messiah. He did not come the first time, be heralded as the Messiah, to live happily ever after. He did not come as Yehovah, Sevaot, who will bloody his garments and will take a sword, a flaming sword, and take out his vengeance in the day of vengeance of our God. No. He will come back, is Yehovah Tsevaot. Right now, he is seated on the right hand of the Father until his enemies are made his footstool. Yeshua will strip the seals of Satan's authority. All hell will break loose on planet Earth. And finally, in the end, after the Ark of the Covenant is revealed, the tabernacle of David, after the, the hordes of hell have their way upon the earth because Satan knows he has but a short time and he goes to war to make war against the saints who had the testimony of Yeshua and keep the commandments of God. Yeshua is going to reign upon this earth. And here is the first time it is pronounced that Yehovah has made Yeshua both Yehovah Tsevaot and Messiah. And no one can really say that Yeshua is Yehovah except by the Holy Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit of God or you'll not recognize that he is the one. He is the one who will rule this earth. He was the one who will raise the dead at the last day and there will be 
a judgment for all who have ever lived. I run over a little bit, and so I will leave you with this blessing. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yehovah, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace until Yeshua, the Prince of Peace, Yehovah Tsevaot, reigns from his throne in Jerusalem with a rod of iron, and we rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Amen, amen. Shabbat Shalom, see you next week. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.